the, the dye wolf. A company has been using genetic engineering and ancient DNA to breed three dye wolf puppies in a move to de-extinct the species. Uh, the particular type of snow white wolf was alive over 10,000 years ago and even featured, like I said, in the TV. I don't know what they must have bleached just normal wolves. I don't know how they did it, but in the Game of Thrones. Uh, but it's not the first animal they've been working on. Do you remember the woolly mouse? Not the woolly mammoth, the woolly mouse uh, that we uh, saw just a few weeks ago, actually. This was the same company as they attempt to bring back the woolly mammoth. Um, and they also want to bring back the Tasmanian tiger. Their attempts at de-extinction have attracted criticism. And uh, paleontologists have even compared, I think, yeah, uh, compared their efforts to the sci-fi film Jurassic Park. But how exactly did they do it? And more importantly, I think, why? Uh, Matt James joins me now, who's the Chief Animal Officer at Colossal Labs. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining me. This has been the news, hasn't it? I mean, it's rocked the world. Um, let's start with those people who are saying, oh, well, these aren't dye wolves. These are just grey wolves with a little bit of manipulation. Well, you know, I, I hate to break their hearts, but these are 100% dire wolves. Um, you know, one of the amazing things that Colossal has is this ability to sequence ancient DNA. And our, our chief scientist, Beth Shapiro, leads one of the uh, leading ancient DNA labs in the world. And what we have now is 500 times more data than anybody else has on what makes a dire wolf a dire wolf. And what we've done is find those key areas of the dire wolf genome, and we've engineered those into a gray wolf, which is already 99.5% dire wolf, and we've created the world's first ever de-extincted species. I mean, it is my, it is absolutely mind blowing. Um, talk me through where you got this DNA from, how you sourced it, how you found it, and and then in idiot terms, because I'm not the brightest person in the box. Um, when you say you sequenced DNA, it isn't the DNA you've extracted being used, is it? it it's something else. Can you explain that to me? Something else, that's right. So we've yeah. been working with natural history museums here in the United States, where the dire wolf was, was originally from. And we've worked with uh, samples that are 13,000 years old and 72,000 years old. Wow. And we literally punch a little bit of bone uh, out of that and we grind up that bone and we can digest DNA from it. And it comes in these little tiny fragments because it's so old, it's been breaking uh, into pieces for years and years and years. And we sequence that. So literally we use a computer program that can help you read and identify identify every sort of A, C, G, and T within the DNA code. And then once we have all the little tiny fragments sequenced, we use artificial intelligence and machine learning ability in a computer to help re-piece the genome. And then that shows us the sequence of what a, of a dire wolf was. Then we can under identify genes within that sequence that are responsible for different phenotypes, like that beautiful white coat, the bigger size, the larger the larger jaw structure, and we can engineer that into the gray wolf genome that gives it dire wolf genes and makes it from a gray wolf into a dire wolf. Now, there's a lot of people as well from, from my reading and understanding of this are saying that, that you know, dire wolves 10,000 years ago would have lived a, a very... I know they, they, these wolves are in a secret location, but they may have eaten different food, they may have uh, have had uh, different experiences. Um, the, the human contact for a start is, you know... So although you might be genetically looking at something that's a dire wolf, can they truly be dire wolves if they're not living the same experience? No, it's a great question. It's a philosophical question that I think de-extinction is pushing to the forefront. What we're doing is we're creating sort of the, the, the best replica we can of the species, but we're also making sure that it's not made to survive in yesterday's world. We're making sure it's ready to survive in today and tomorrow's climate. That said, the dire wolf came right here from the United States. It persisted just so, up to about 10,000 years ago, which really in geological time is not that long ago. And what we've done is we've studied its distribution across space and time. We've understood what are the climactic conditions like rainfall and temperature in those areas. And we've identified an area in the United States that provides a very similar if not identical habitat. Uh, and what about diet? Presumably in the wild they would have eaten 
uh, other wolves. They would have uh, tracked down uh, uh, other animals to to eat. Are, are they being fed by humans, or are they? I know they're only three yeah. months old at this stage, um, yeah. but but you know, will they be able to live as wild animals? So they currently live in this 2,000 acre secure preserve that that we've made for them. Their diet consists mostly of ungulates, so things like. Uh, deer and horses and cattle, which is very similar to what they would have eaten 12,000 years ago when they were hunting giant bison and, and deer and elk species. So we're still providing them a very similar diet and they're currently, you know, starting on puppy food for lack of a better term, and we're graduating them up to full carcasses. And with these ones, now that we, we, we're seeing two here at, at the yeah. moment. In fact, I think I've only seen two in footage, but you have three. Um, now, uh, forgive me because I failed biology, but are you planning to breed f from these three? And can that be done safely with one girl and two boys? So we do have two boys and a girl, and we will be able to breed them if we choose to. For the time being, they're sexually immature. It'll take them about another year or so be before they hit sexual maturity. And at that point, we can begin to use contraceptive methods to ensure they don't breed until we fully intend to. But for the time being, we're happy with our little pack of three. But what, again, what happens genetically if you've got the same mother and two different males? Well, that's sort of the magic of what we've done here is that these animals do not technically have the same mother. They come from different lines of okay. animals. We've only given them the same dire wolf edits, but they still have unique genetic diversity where they are still interbreedable. But there, was, there is still only one girl, um, and w with her babies, they will be all her and two different men. I mean, I might sound like I'm being really thick, but I, I'm just trying to figure out if if you can, if the second pack, if you like, will they be genetically safe given that the, there's always the woman, the, the girl wolf, but two different boys? So these animals could breed and make very happy, healthy offspring. But if we were to try to create a larger population of animals, we would need to introduce more genetic diversity ah, so that okay. we can have high levels of inbreeding, which we are very capable of. And, and if we would like to expand our direwolf herd, which is something we've talked to Native our Native American partners about returning the direwolf to their Native American lands, we could expand the packs so that they could be reintroduced to other lands. And is that the ultimate goal to repopulate with direwolves? And if that is the case, is that going to be safe to the species that we have 10,000 years later? Well, so first and foremost, our, our concern is the welfare of the individual animals you see on your screen there. We are committed to making sure that these animals lead the happiest and healthiest life that they possibly can. Our next responsibility is to the animals that currently exist today. So these animals will not be, the dire wolves will not be free roaming in places where they would negatively impact other animals. They will be um, living on our secure preserve away from other species, like gray wolf, for example. Um, our intention is really to kind of show the power of the extinction, the ability of what's to come. We will continue this path with woolly mammoth, with the dodo, with the thylacine, in ways that we can reintroduce those animals to the wild to create the biodiversity and the uh, climactic changes that these animals would bring with them. At the same time, we're doing, we, we've created this amazing buzz on the internet, as you might expect, on the news and the headlines. And what we're seeing is this amazing response from the youth about how we're inspiring them to begin to get into the STEM science, you know, the, uh, the STEM uh, world and begin to study sciences and, and other projects. So we're really hoping that this is also an inspirational event to bring people into conservation science. Now, there is that question that I asked uh, of, of my audience. It's just because you can do something should it be done? Yeah. Um, and I think that, that, that again, is a philosophical question, but I think it is quite an important one. Does this need to happen? We are facing the, one of the greatest threats to humanity today, which is the biodiversity loss crisis. We are, between now and 2050, there's an opportunity for us to lose up to 50% of our biodiversity. That isn't just bad for nature, that's bad for humans. It impacts water security and food security. What we are doing is creating the first ever tool that allows us to restore nature that has been lost. 
that restoration is so important. I think the question we need to be asking ourselves, the philo philosophical challenge that I that I bring to the table is, if we have the power and we don't use it, is that more irresponsible? If we have the ability to repair nature, should we not be acting? And that's what Colossal is doing right now. Okay, so, so, so talk me through why the woolly mammoth. I mean, we've all seen your woolly mouse. Very cute, yeah. um, and and uh, I mean, and then in a in a second, you you introduce these wolves, which I don't think anybody saw coming. But um, well played. But uh, the, why the woolly mammoth? So the woolly mammoth came from this amazing vast distribution across the globe, and and where a lot of their distribution today is areas that would be sort of Arctic tundra, you know, areas that have low levels of biodiversity and life. Back when the mammoth persisted, those ecosystems, the mammoth steppe grassland, was as biodiverse as the African savanna is today. Our ability to open up new ecological niches in an ever-changing climate here on Earth is important to support the, the, the growth of biodiversity. By growing biodiversity and restoring a grassland that's as diverse as the African savanna, we're creating new places for animals to thrive while also creating natural processes that can help strengthen and make us more adaptable against climate change. But a lot of people, again, would say they went extinct for a reason. Um, you know, everything, we all, everything moves on. Um, do we not just leave them in the past and concentrate on the species that are just about to go extinct here? Well, what's amazing about our science is that we are creating technologies that help prevent extinctions today. So along with the dire wolf announcement that we just made, we also announced that we cloned four red wolves, which is the most endangered wolf in the world. It's the, a wolf that's endemic to the United States and is on the brink of extinction. It's in dire need of a technological advancement in order to genetically rescue it so that it does not blink out tomorrow. Well, at the same time, we're doing that, that type of work with the Northern White Rhino, with the Mauritian Pink Pigeon, so for us, it is not an either or proposition. Right. The answer is both. And the difference between, because I was also thinking that if you found a, a, an intact woolly mammoth under the ice somewhere um, and the DNA hadn't been degraded, is that then cloning as opposed to de-extinction? Well, so unfortunately, even with the amazing preservation that we found in woolly mammoths, the DNA is still so degraded that you cannot okay. find viable cells that you could clone from. So that's the difference. So that, that, that's, that's when you're talking about you can clone from a living uh, creature, but you have to go through this really complicated process to bring something back. So it's not that's like, not like Jurassic Park at all then. Exactly, not like Jurassic Park at all. It's actually sort of the inverse of what Jurassic Park is. Even with animals that may have recently died as few as a few days ago, the DNA has begun to degrade to a point okay. where cloning is very inefficient. I mean, some people will be concerned as well about what this would, what this might look like with human beings, right? Let's take it to the extreme because there will be people mm -hmm. who say this is against God. This is this is a terrible thing to be doing. I'm not one of them, by the way. But um, so, what would what would stop you from de-extincting a human being, and and would that work? Well, beside the ethics and the morals of me and, and Colossal and my colleagues, I think there are plenty of laws and regulations that prevent exactly that. But it could be done. I mean, the technology for that has existed well before Colossal. Actually, humans would be, you know, scientifically speaking, would be maybe a, an easier lift than what we've done here with the dire wolf. And, and what, if you had your wish list of what animal you would bring back, what would you bring back? Well, I'm going to start with the woolly mammoth, the dodo, the thylacine. We've, I'm really lucky in that I'm at a company where we have an active wish list that we're pursuing today. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. And, and finally, I know these wolves are, are uh, being kept in a secret location. <laughs> um, is that because they are possibly the most valuable creatures on the planet right now? I think not just economically, but you know, sort of what they represent. The power of the extinction is such a valuable tool um, that my first responsibility is to the individual animals and my team that work with these animals. When we announced the woolly mouse that you talked about last month, we had people coming to the front door of our lab because they wanted to visit them. 
So imagine what is happening today with with the uh, with the dire wolf. We have to make sure that the animals are as safe as they can be, that our staff is as safe as they can be, and that people from the public don't want to try to get too close to these very large wolves. Yeah. How did you get the job that you've got, the best job in the world, the most interesting, exciting job in the world? How did that happen? I ask myself that every day. I'm still confused. I'm a little lost of how I ended up here. But I was working in nonprofit conservation, fighting the fight against biodiversity loss. And and I was introduced to our amazing CEO, Ben Lamb, who sh sort of shed this idea that we could use you know genetic engineering and reproductive science to not just bring species back from extinction, but to prevent future extinction. And that was my calling in life. And I've been here for the last three and a half years. It's absolutely amazing and, and mind-blowing in equal measure. I, I, again, I've got one more question. How does, I could keep you here all night to be fair, um, how, how does Colossal make its money? How does it benefit from, from this process or is it all altruistic? No, it's it, there is a monetization strategy. And as you might imagine, the, the number of technologies that have to come together to create mm -hmm. the suite of tools to make de-extinction possible is numerous right and so we have all these different technologies like multiplex gene engineering you know like our ai and, and machine learning um, tools that when they when we develop them for the purpose of de-extinction and they have obvious applications to other fields of science we'll spin those out as companies so we've actually colossal wow. started three years ago and in the last three years spun out three new standalone companies that represent individual technologies. Well, listen, if you ever need a press secretary, please pull my name first. I'm very happy to come and work with you uh, on this. It's been fascinating, Matt. Thank you so much. And congratulations on this. This is very, very, very exciting. Uh, Matt James there, Chief Animal Officer at Colossal Labs.